member for Saanich North and Islands. It's overwhelming. I uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to use my time here speaking uh, to Bill 10, the Income Tax Amendment Act, uh, to expand on the comments that uh, I made while addressing my colleague's amendment. The legislation in front of us is only a small piece of the overall framework that this government has brought forward to entice LNG to British Columbia. I know that this government will speak to the complexity of the investment decisions, the carefully constructed economic models, which, by the way, only have revenue, which are lacking the other side of it. But anyways, the carefully constructed economic models and foreca forecasting that is done for the price of natural gas years from now. But let's be very clear about what's actually in front of us in this House today. The previous government threw everything they could into the financial package for LNG communities, companies, in the hopes of attracting investment. None would come. Despite what the member opposite was going on about, the reality was this government on the other, the former government on the other side did everything they could while having a majority, and they were not able to get one LNG facility landed to our province. You see, it turns out we are very good at knowing all the different technological and geopolitical factors that go into estimating the price of natural gas. I think my colleague who spoke formally has gone to considerable effort to highlight just how vehemently the current members of government, the NDP, the BC NDP, were in opposition. They highlighted their concerns with how the former mem members across the way were, quote unquote, giving our resource away. Just giving it away. They spoke time and time and time again. And yet, if we turn to the legislation in front of us, the one that we're debating today, we have a small piece of the broader fiscal package that this government has now brought forward that actually weakens the regime that the former government, the former BC Liberal government, advanced. We have an astonishing example of corporate welfare, an astonishing example of corporate welfare being delivered to us in a package called Bill 10. They, the current government has provided a further $6 billion in tax relief to this industry. So let's review. When the BC, uh, former BC Liberal government was in play, the then opposition BC NDP called their uh, package uh, giving the resource away. Now when the BC NDP government is in power, they are further advancing the corporate welfare package by $6 billion. We heard the Minister of Energy and Mines going on and on and on about how excited she is for all of the investments that can be made because this pro project is coming to British Columbia. I have to ask, what more could we do with the $6 billion, billion dollars that this government has further given away? We're not talking about that, though, are we? I understand the great difficulty and challenge that government has in trying to construct these regimes. They're complex. I will give them that. But looking at the timing of this LNG program, 2023 to 2043, my children will be retired when this... Do, do, don't worry about it. My children will be retired. My grandchildren will see the end of this project, if I'm lucky enough to have grandchildren. So this project is an inheritance for our grandchildren. What I don't understand is why, at this moment in time, when we see children around the world rising up to call on governments to act on climate change, our government 
is constructing complicated tax regimes to further underwrite major fossil fuel expansion in British Columbia. It makes absolutely no sense. Why is this same energy, this same dog determination not being squarely pointed at the opportunity that we have in British Columbia to leverage our strengths and build a sustainable and innovative economy? Why is it that the that, why is it that not the opportunity that the government scramble all over each other to put forward the most cost effective, the most bold approach to deliver? Instead, we're climbing over top of each other in this place in a race to the bottom. This government, like the former government, has its priorities backward. My children inspire, my children inspire me. I watch them grow and learn for them from their curiosity. They are beautiful and unblemished in their thoughts and actions. It's why the climate marches that took place just a short few weeks ago had such an effect on all of us. Watching kids as young as eight and nine years old, as well as students in middle school and high school rallying together, it's truly historic. Seeing signs that say we should be preparing for the future, not fighting for it, or the climate is changing, why aren't we? These messages should be tragic messages to the adults that should be making mature decisions in this place, not only about today, but for future generations as well, the future that our children and our grandchildren, and if in fact you don't have children or grandchildren, your nieces and nephews, the children and grandchildren of your friends and family, they also should matter. We should not be allowed to disassociate ourselves with the future simply because we don't, we don't have the children to look to. We have a responsibility as leaders to respond to this call of our youth, not by patting them on their heads, but with real action. We are the ones who can set our province on a path that shows them that we actually care about the problems that they are inheriting from the decisions that we are making in this place. And we have the solutions right in front of us. Clean BC offers one such vision that, if followed, could chart a bold path for our province. While this work might be difficult, the choice isn't complicated. The kids get it, and it's really quite simple. We need to fully commit to building a sustainable, low-carbon economy. It's the only one that will offer the next generation the opportunities that they need to have healthy and fulfilling lives. As my colleague from the Couch and Valley says, said, it's the vision that gives our communities a real pathway to prosperity. So I ask my colleagues in the BC NDP who do not support the subsidization of climate change to stand up and be accounted for. Our children need to know that we, their elected leaders, the people that many of them voted for in schools, in the school vote, won't continue to do the things that we fundamentally disagree with. And I know that not all of you agree with selling out our future generations. I know that there are many people in this House that are concerned with the information that they have been told about this LNG program, that there are concerns that the dog whistles have replaced facts, that the balance sheet should include both the revenue and the expenditure. And, what you, and that, you have not seen the whole picture just by looking at the potential forecasted revenue or have been wooed by the tens of billions of dollars, the emphasis so heavy on the B, you can't miss it. But what about the expenses side of that balance sheet? Have you asked those questions? What will the cost of runaway climate change cost us? Let's just ponder that for a second. Is it the $43 billion that's forecasted in revenue over the next 20 years? Will that cover runaway climate change, the cost of wildfires, the cost of diking against sea level rise? Do we recognize that the entire estuary of the Fraser River will need to be, will need to be diked? 
Do we know the billions of dollars that that's going to cost? Is there anybody in this government right now that's looking at the cost, that's, nope. that's building the plan? Nope. What about the Cowichan, what about the Cowichan River? Are we, are we looking at the protection of that estuary? Nope. The Skeena? Nope. The NAS? Nope. Where's the money coming from? The money? The money is coming from plenty of other, uh, of other industries that this government should be chasing not LNG, not be sucked into the black hole of 43 billions of dollars while, in, while, while subsidizing climate change. There are plenty of other more creative options than just grabbing the one that was dangling in front of us because it was uncompleted work from the former government. That is not good enough. Our children need to know that we, their elected leaders, are going to stand up for them. What liability are we leaving our children? <coughs> My children, your children, your grandchildren. So this is our time. This is our time to stand up and be accounted for. And I know that our hearts and our minds are heavy with this burden in this place. The burden that the member raised. How do we pay for this? It's a burden that we all carry. It's one that, that, it's one that we can relieve ourselves with by not subsidizing the problem that's creating the huge expenses that our children are going to have to find the solutions for. Our children want to know that their leaders are inspired by their hope. They need to see that their action is having an impact on the decisions that are being made in this room. Our children need to trust that their leaders will make the right decision, not the politically advantageous decision. This is not about political gain. It's about the future of this province, and it's about the future of our family members. Let's show them that they can trust their leaders. They have now seen members of this government actively campaign against something and then capitulate. I think once can be understood. Twice is a pattern, a dangerous pattern. So no, I will not be complicit in taxpayer-funded giveaways that help support a large fossil fuel industry in this province. I will not help the, LN the NDP implement an LNG regime. I am choosing to stand with my children and those around the world that are demanding a different pathway and a different future. I am not going to be part of any further subsidization of climate change in this province. And with that, Madam Speaker, I want to move an amendment. I move that the motion for second reading of Bill No. 10 in titled Income Tax Amendment Act 2019 be amended by deleting the word now and substitu substituting six months hence. The member from Saanich North and the Islands has moved that the motion for a second reading of Bill No. 10 in Titchwood Income Tax Income Amendment Act 2019 be amended by deleting the word now and substituting six months hence. Proceed, member. Thank you, Madam on, Speaker. On the amendment. Yeah, thank you, Madam Speaker. And I, I want to stand and, and speak in support of my amendment, which 
It'd be kind of crazy if I didn't. But anyway, um, yeah. I think that it's important that we recognize that uh, the bill that we have in front of us uh, came earlier this week. And I, and I don't know if it's been, the, the opportunity has been there for people to fully understand the impact that this is going to have in our province. That they Peace River South. My apologies, I seek leave to make an introduction. Shall leave be granted? Please proceed. Thank you. My apologies for interrupting what might be a, a riveting a speech, but I thought I wanted to take the opportunity, seeing him in the gallery, to uh, introduce to the House uh, Mayor Germuth, who's actually here visiting uh, us today. As most people will know, he is the mayor of Kitimat, which is going to be ground zero for uh, LNG projects. And so will the House please make uh, his worship welcome to the House. Member Sandage North and the Islands, continue. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank uh, the member from one of the Peace Rivers for uh, giving me a little break. And I know that the other Peace River will be standing up very shortly here to speak, so, and welcome to the, your worship, the mayor. Uh, I think that it's important that uh, when we're voting on this package, uh, this subsidization of this industry, that we're, when we're voting on it, that we understand and have the time to fully, uh, to fully understand the implications that this has. I think that it's easy for, uh, much easier for government to put out and to dangle and to emphasize the b, b, b in the billions. But it's much, much more difficult for us to really take the time to understand what the impact of this decision is going to have. And, you know, indeed, this is one of the challenges that we have with climate change, of course. It happens very slowly and over time. And we, in, our, in this place, can trick ourselves into believing that the decisions that we're making in these, in these houses, in these chambers, are not having any real impact on what's going on out there. And yet, the severity of the storms that hit my riding this, this winter are unlike that they've ever been. We were in, uh, in the Nicola Valley, and the chiefs there were telling us that indeed they had a 1,000-year flood, and then the very next year they had a 500-year flood. And the chief looked, and it's a joke that's often made. He says, I think that I've probably got the least best luck of any chief because he has faced the two most severe floods that his community has faced. And these, these costs that are being handed to these communities are not sustainable. Their ability to be able to handle these costs is overwhelming the resources that our First Na that the First Nations communities throughout the province and the small, indeed the small communities have in the province. Who is accounting for that? How are we, are, are we taking the time to actually think this through? Are we taking the time to actually ask the questions of those that are putting the documents in front of us, telling us this is a good thing? Are we asking them, how are we accounting for the other side of that balance sheet? And frankly, I don't think that we are. I haven't seen that. All I have seen is it dangled in front of us that, in fact, we're going to be able to generate these billions of dollars from this industry. It's a, it's a, it's a quick and easy route to generate money without thinking through the impacts that this is going to have. So I move this, this uh, amendment to uh, substitute the word now and, and substitute it with six months hence to give this House an opportunity to truly think through the implications that this is going to have, to truly think and consider the decision that's about to be made to subsidize the, the, the corporate welfare package that's being handed to this company to subsidize climate change, the impacts that our children and grandchildren, the future generations are going to inherit from this decision, that it's not just dropped in front of us, debated very quickly, at a very high level, everyone comes in here and votes, people coming in here and asking, what are we voting on? Pretty embarrassing. 
pretty So impressed. I think that it's important that we take the time to work this through. I know everybody's in a big hurry because the, the LNG company said, if you don't do this, you're going to, uh, we're, we, we have to walk or whatever the threat is. The reality is they've already got us over the barrel on this, on this, uh, on this deal. It's a powder keg and it's about to explode on us. And I think that it would, would be prudent for us to really take the time to think through the decisions that, that uh, it appears 80, whatever the number is, 84 or 83, whatever the number is, are willing to stand up and make without asking uh, any questions or having the time to think this through. Thank you, Madam Speaker.